This is from a little later in the first half of the book. Um, this, oh, I've read this part with that part before. This is more bike riding, but it's not just about bikes. Did you all see the movie Premium Rush? Yeah. Did you like it? <laughs> <laughs> I give you Sonia Trejo, the drummer for my band Angela Chase for three years, who is on tour with a band I've never heard of that was on Creation Records and is a big deal, the Telescopes. <laughs> Sonia rules. <laughs> Steps waiting at the apartment, which is odd because she drives to work, and New York City traffic means that riding a bike is usually way faster than driving. But she's on the couch, in her work clothes, with a bottle of organic red wine because she knows that estradiol and non-organic red wine don't mix. The fact that she's got the whole bottle of wine on the table, her own glass half full and Maria's empty, waiting, says that they are going to have a long conversation, a bottle long talk. Hi, she says, and she stands up, hugs Maria. I left work early, she says. Do you want wine? Thanks. She pours a glass. Maria wonders about the food. She barely ate lunch and probably ought to eat something. Steph's on the couch now, though, ready to launch in, so eating gets deprioritized. Maria's like, maybe I should have that shot first. A little context. <laughs> Maria has, has, is late for giving herself a shot of estrogen, which is making her a little bit emotionally volatile. And on the way home, just before this scene happens, she has decided to break up with Steph. Maria's like, maybe I should have that shot first. It wouldn't really make her formal, feel more lucid until tomorrow, though, so a shot gets deprioritized, too. She sits on the couch a thigh's width away from Steph. Look, Steph says, I am breaking up with you. <laughs> Ten minutes later, Maria's on her bike again. There will be no closure, no conversation, no figuring out what the fuck is going on tonight. She slugged down that glass of wine without any food, and now she's on her bike, flying down Jamaica Avenue. Piranha doesn't live anywhere nearby, and who knows what her neighborhood is even called. It's just way the fuck down, south and west, towards where all the signs are in Russian and the avenues have letters for names. Maria hasn't called her yet, and she also hasn't decided whether she's going to stop into a bar for another drink or two. Probably not. The desire to self-obliterate isn't as intense as the fear of dealing with people. And Piranha is maybe the greatest fucking genius who ever lived at not dealing with people. So Maria rides for a while, fast, until her legs hurt and her lungs won't breathe right anymore, but she doesn't really know which way south or west are. She thought she'd been pointing in the right direction, but maybe she's never ridden from her own apartment to Piranha's. Maybe she's always gone there from work or taken the train. Weird. She's in some kind of clean-looking neighborhood full of two-story apartment buildings and parking lots. She's like, I bet I'm either near the ocean or in Queens. She finds a subway station, carries her bike down the stairs and checks a map, chest heaving, face damp in the humid night. She's in Queens, near the ocean. She pretty much went in exactly the wrong direction, which is more due to the way she rides her bike than her emotional state. She tends to just point in a direction and trust that she'll get there. It almost always works. Who knows how she got so turned around, but whatever. Riding feels good, so she doesn't get on a train. She lugs her bike back up to the street and starts to ride. As soon as she's going pretty fast, she gets doored. Shit luck. She, do we know what getting doored is? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um. <laughs> Sorry about it. <laughs> I wasn't going to talk about her. What's up, Christine? How's it going, dude? <laughs> Yeah, we'll talk about it at the after party. <laughs> as soon as she's going pretty fast, she gets doored. Shit luck. She kind of bounces off, falls on the ground, bounces up, and glares at the person. She doesn't say a word to boring-looking white guy in the car, just makes a feral face, gets back on her bike, and bails. Okay, good. Almost immediately, she's going fast again, cutting through a busy-looking intersection as the light turns yellow. Soon, she recognizes her own neighborhood, then she recognizes the neighborhood next to it, and then the next one. It's dark out at this point, and the air is all misty around the streetlights. It's like a picture inside a New Jersey punk record from the 90s, all serene and lonesome and pretty. Her face is kind of wet. Did somebody just whistle at that? <laughs> what? Uh, at the after party, I'll show you my New Jersey tattoo, y'all. It's, <laughs> it's pretty cool. Her face is kind of wet, and she starts to worry that it's going to rain for real, that she's going to show up at Piranha's with a total butt stripe. It doesn't, though. It's just misty. Turns out Piranha's neighborhood is really far away, though. Inevitably, Maria runs out of adrenaline. She stops at a red light, even though when there's no cars, you're supposed to blow through stoplights to show that you are an anarchist. 
She sort of starts to process the conversation she and Steph had about half an hour ago. Ambush. While Maria was freaking out about how to have that conversation, Steph figured out how to communicate more directly than either of them has ever done before. There wasn't much to say after that. Maria was like, I was gonna break up with you too, and then they just kind of looked at each other. Steph cried, and for a minute, Maria felt like she might not, and she felt heartless and mean down to the bottom of her lungs, but then she cried too, just a little. They hugged, and Maria said something about figuring out logistics tomorrow, but that she had to go get drunk right now. Steph laughed, which made Maria feel like probably one day they'd be friends. Dykes. <laughs> it feels shitty not to have gotten to say all the shit that Maria is just realizing she needed to say about patterns of checking out in her own life and stuff, but I am not your girlfriend anymore is pretty close to I don't have to listen to your shit anymore. And plus, who actually wants to say those things out loud, no matter how bad you need to? The light changes and Maria realizes, wait, shit, hold on, I am elated. It's that feeling like you just left on a car trip for Arizona or Michigan or something and you don't have to worry about rent or work or feeding the cat or anything at all for a whole week. Except there's no time limit. I don't have to take care of myself or sleep or bathe. <laughs> this might be kind of a bad news train of thought. Past that stoplight, the road goes downhill for a really long time and her bike feels like a Pegasus or something. A Pegasus. I don't think about that. It's trite to say you feel like you're flying, but it's like flying. She spreads her arms out like Kate Winslet on the bow of the Titanic. <laughs> At the bottom of the hill is the edge of Park Slope. Piranha's house is still like miles away, and even though it's not raining, the mist is soaking through her clothes, so Maria decides to take the train. This is the actual reason that she doesn't know her, the way on her bike. It's a pointlessly far ride. She realizes she's gotten bored right around here before. She is a catharsis biker, not a distance biker. Plus, on the train, you get to read books and drink whiskey, so she stops in the liquor store and buys a flask. This is a theme in the novel. <laughs> she doesn't want to be drunk, but she does want to be drinking. It occurs to her to text Piranha. Uh, Steph broke up with me, coming over. She gets on the train without waiting for a reply because what's she gonna say, no? Plus, Piranha's not gonna be doing anything. She hates everybody way too much to go out when she doesn't have to. The Q train is pretty full because it's a Tuesday night and the people who work in the city live in fancy two-story homes out by Piranha, so they're all on their way back. Maria gets into the role of dirty punk with bright fake colored hair, taking up too much space, smelling bad, and drinking whiskey. <laughs> like, she's known real crusties, and she is not a real crusty, but in comparison to these investment bankers, she is like boxcar Bertha. She's also excited to be reading a book called Big Black Penis, which is about masculinity and black men. She holds it up high so everybody can read the title. It's for the best that she rarely feels excitement like this because she's kind of being confrontational about it. The train rolls on, the people empty out, and then she's at the Avenue Z stop, so she tucks the book in her bag and hauls her bike out. Piranha has texted back, shit, okay, do you want beer? Thanks. All right, this, this part is shorter. This is, so the book is in two halves. One takes place in New York, one takes place in Nevada, the titular Nevada. Um, and this is the beginning of the second half. Star City, Nevada is fucking bullshit. <laughs> James grew up in the worst fucking town and he still lives here and he's probably going to die here. It's stupid. It was a boom town in the late 1800s, all beefy cowboys and ladies of the night or whatever, and then everybody realized there was no fucking gold here and left for California. <laughs> then, nothing happened here for a hundred years. It was just a shitty little stream dribbling between two shitty little mountains until sometime around when he was born in the mid-90s when the Walmart Corporation saw an opportunity for brand infiltration and blew a hole in the side of one of the mountains and put a little bridge across the middle of the parking lot so the stream could run through the middle and differentiate the Star City Walmart from every other Walmart in the country that doesn't have a stupid fucking stream running through it. <laughs> he actually kind of likes the stream. As soon as there was a Walmart in Star City, the people who got jobs at the Walmart needed places to live, so they built these shitty condos down the length of the stream. And then, when all the waterfront property was taken up, they started paving streets away from the stream until they practically almost had a fucking town here. Almost a town. There's a truck stop out toward Route 80 and a couple stores that aren't Walmart. A shitty little florist, a shitty kind of big garage. But mostly, since Walmart sells everything every other shitty little store would sell anyway, this town is like there is a mountain with a Walmart on it. 
Then there are a bunch of stupid buildings on the hill spread out beneath it. Then there are some more houses around where the ground flattens out. There's a steep road that goes straight down the hill and a less steep road that swerves around the long way down the hill. And last year, they put in a GameStop and a Subway and six empty stores in a strip mall be between the highway and the Walmart. But mostly, what they have is dirt and dust and nothing and majestic boring visas and bored asshole teenagers and stars. The name of the shitty little town makes it sound like celebrities would vacation here or something, like in a dumb cop show from the 70s or a two-dimensional stage set from an old black and white movie. But really, the only reason to name this shitty town Star City is that at night, there are so many fucking stars above it. As long as you are facing away from the Walmart. <laughs> That's the big picture. That's Star City from above, the establishing shot, how it looks from the outside. Not that James would know. The furthest outside Star City he's ever been is Reno, like four times. If you're from Reno, Star City probably looks like some debris and nothing next to a mountain. But if you grew up here, it's probably because your parents moved here to work at the new Walmart when it opened because there were no fucking jobs anywhere in Nevada in the mid-90s. Or something? Unless you wanted to deal blackjack in Reno, but neither of James's parents wanted to work in a casino. Whatever, who cares? James grew up here and it is stupid. Fuck Star City. <laughs> the small picture, the tight shot, the close up is that James is stoned as hell, reclined in the flimsy plastic bathtub with the black grout or whatever the fuck it is called, the moldy stuff that seals the tub to the floor and the wall. He is hotboxing the bathroom of his apartment halfway down the hill from the Walmart. Right now, he is too stoned to tell if the water is hot or cold. It is probably lukewarm. Who knows? He sits up and looks at the mirror and can't see anything because there's so much smoke in here and also because that shit is all fogged up from how hot the bathwater was some impossible to know amount of time ago. He's thinking about how much he hates Star City and why it produces such apathetic and useless fucks. Figure one, James. Figure two, Nicole. But mostly, he is just stoned and spacing out. He keeps coming back to how cheap this bathroom feels. This town sprung up out of nowhere and they built these shitty apartments out of bullshit, but it's weird how even though he feels numb about pretty much everything else in his life, he can't quite get accustomed to his shitty apartment. The material of the tub against his bony ass feels like he could get up and punch through it. Brittle plastic, brittle bones. James smokes weed specifically so he can think about his ass against his bathtub and not about the fact that his girlfriend Nicole left an hour ago, stormed out in an angry huff. He's in the bathtub because on some level he knew that if he hadn't given himself a project, immediately, he would have followed her out of the apartment, out into the parking lot and made amends, apologized, patched things up. But she's right to be mad. There is something wrong with him. He has no idea what the fuck it is, but he does need to figure it out if he's ever going to have a normal human relationship. So he was like, well, I'll hotbox my bathroom and think about it. <laughs> he's working on it. He gave himself a job. He left his phone on the bed, went into the bathroom, and blocked the crack at the bottom of the door with a towel, an old habit from getting high at his mom's house when he was 14 that he didn't even realize he didn't need to do anymore. He made sure he hadn't at some point accidentally put the batteries back into the smoke detector, ran a bath, and blazed the shit out of 10 or $20 worth of weed. He even used the bong, not one of the pipes. Smoked the buds, no shake. The plan was to smoke until there was no air left in the bathroom, to smoke until he could see through time, to smoke until he figured his shit out. <laughs> and he's figuring his shit out. Everybody knows that smoking weed is hardly the path to self-knowledge or anything. It's probably the path away from self-knowledge, unless self-knowledge is like thinking about establishing shots in Stanley Kubrick movies. It is not. But the shit is seriously better for figuring out his shit than sitting on the couch with Nicole, again, watching some dumb movie she wants to watch because all the movies James like are, likes are creepy or gross or impenetrable or whatever. He should have brought his iPod speakers in here or something. Even with smoke instead of air in here, it feels shitty to think about this stuff. Fuck feelings. 